My last video prompted a number of messages from people who don't accept evolution. This video addresses some of their misconceptions and explains some of the basics. One of the first things to understand is that the theory of evolution is not concerned with the origins or development of the universe, or how life was first begun. It explains how different living organisms have developed and diversified since life first appeared on Earth. Even if life on Earth had been initiated by some kind of divine or alien intervention, that wouldn't affect the evidence for evolution, which, incidentally, is accepted by people who believe in one or more gods, as well as those who don't. To start with some observations that are easily appreciated, we know that physical characteristics of parents are inherited by offspring, and that through the artificial process of selective breeding, many traits exhibited by a given life form can be exaggerated in later generations. This can be achieved fairly simply by mating together individuals that exhibit those traits most strongly and repeating this process with successive generations. Breed only from horses with good competition records and their offspring will tend to perform well also. Breed only from aggressive dogs and their offspring will tend to be aggressive. <laughs> Many who happily acknowledge this kind of artificial selection are the same people who label evolution impossible or a fairy tale. And yet natural selection, one of the major mechanisms that drives evolution, requires no magical suspension or violation of physical laws. It merely states that traits also emerge and reproductive opportunities are also limited because of factors other than human influence. If a greyhound breeder selects only the fastest dogs for breeding stock, and in the wild female birds of paradise favour males that have the most impressive plumage so that only those males get the opportunity to reproduce, then both nature and the greyhound breeder are favouring certain individuals for reproducing offspring and passing on their genetic information to the next generation. Before I say more about natural selection, I want to mention another commonly misunderstood term, mutation. Many think that when biologists talk about mutation, they're referring only to dramatic malformations like animals with extra limbs or heads, or far-fetched scenarios like dogs producing cats, or even morphing into cats. These are misconceptions. Mutations are simply changes in genetic variation within a population, brought about by insertions, deletions and recombinations of the DNA sequence. But mutation isn't the only cause of variation, because it's not only the DNA sequence that's important to evolution. Epigenetic studies, for example, show that genes can be switched on or off, and that this genetic activation or inhibition can be inherited and expressed in later generations. Most variations are neutral and have no impact on an organism's survival, accumulating naturally over successive generations in what's known as genetic drift, the effects of which are far more dramatic in smaller populations. But a variation in colour, for example, could have a major impact on survival. Take this insect. If genetic variation makes some of its offspring less conspicuous to predators, they'll have a greater chance of surviving and reproducing, and in the course of time the insects with this variation may become more abundant within the population. If the variation makes other offspring more conspicuous to predators, they may not survive to reproduce, and the variation may vanish from the population through natural selection. Many who don't understand evolution try to discredit it by equating it with pure accident. But it's not pure accident that camouflage, hooves, petals, antennae, fins, wings, eyes and roots have evolved in the natural world. All these physical characteristics have served specific functions in contributing towards different organisms' reproductive success, and clearly if the organisms that exhibit these characteristics manage to reproduce, they perpetuate their genetic information, including the information for the characteristics, in the next generation. Even attributes that give no particular advantage to an organism can still be favoured if they're associated with other attributes that do. For example, having leaves that appear green isn't necessarily beneficial to plants, but chlorophyll is green and chlorophyll is beneficial because it enables plants to gain energy from light by photosynthesis. When it comes to beneficial characteristics, there's no one-size-fits-all. Bulk may be a great advantage for a walrus wanting to dominate its rivals, but it would be a distinct disadvantage to a spider monkey that's adapted to a life of swinging nimbly through trees. Again, it's no accident that walruses have evolved to be bulky and spider monkeys have evolved slender supple limbs. These physical attributes have helped them to operate in their respective environments, to survive and compete for reproduction. People who say that evolution is all about impossibly unlikely accidents and blind luck often like to claim that the probability of life forms evolving is the same as the probability of winning the jackpot on a one-armed bandit hundreds of times in a row, or even thousands, depending on how creative they're feeling with numbers. 
but miraculous accidents are the opposite of what evolution is about. If we're going to use the one-armed bandit analogy, then evolution presses the whole button on almost all symbols on every pull of the lever. Starting with a word, we only need to change one of its letters to turn it into a new word. Changing one letter from this word results in further new words. And if we carry on repeating the process, we can produce words that have no letters in common with the original. Dramatic change can be achieved one small step at a time, and this is what happens with evolution, except that with evolution, countless mostly minute changes have accumulated over millions of years. If members of a given species become geographically isolated from each other, each group may end up having to respond to very different environments and predators and adapt to very different ways of gathering food. Any genetic variation will no longer be shared throughout the whole population, but only within each group, so that genetic drift and natural selection may lead to the emergence of two distinct populations, which after a given period of time may no longer be related closely enough to interbreed. The theory of evolution does not say that organisms from one species population suddenly produce organisms from another. Dogs don't produce cats. Nor does the theory of evolution say that individual organisms change species. Individual apes don't morph into humans. Nor again does the theory of evolution demand the existence of crocoducks. The crocoduck argument implies that evolution requires all possible combinations of known species to exist. If you require a crocoduck to exist, you require a rhinopus to exist. If you require these to exist, you require a rhinocrocoductpus to exist, and so on towards infinity. There are millions of species to combine and recombine and recombine. But the theory of evolution says something very different. It doesn't reward every possible combination of physical features. Even once successful species are being driven to extinction all the time, Evolution rewards only whatever is most efficient at reproducing itself. No particular species is guaranteed to emerge through evolution. Some people feel that an acceptance of evolution implies or leads inevitably towards the desire for supremacist control over the breeding of human beings. But recognising facts about nature doesn't mean you have any wish to apply them to social policy and commit gross violations of human rights. Evolution isn't an endorsement of eugenics, any more than accepting the fact that the females of numerous species kill and eat the males after mating is an endorsement of cannibalism. It's simply a recognition of reality. Besides, we've already unwittingly been applying evolutionary principles to the artificial refinement of plants and animals for hundreds of years. The humble banana wouldn't exist without humans, because the fruit of the banana tree is sterile and it depends for its survival on human cultivation by vegetative cloning. The banana in your fruit bowl has a rather interesting history. It's quite unlike the wild banana from which it's derived, which is dark green and contains inedible pips. This naturally occurring variety was bred into the green and red cooking bananas we call plantains through systematic cultivation over many hundreds of years. But in 1836, the Jamaican Jean-Francois Pujot found that one of the plantain trees on his plantation was bearing yellow fruit rather than green or red. A natural mutation had changed its colour and given it a sweeter taste, making it edible without any need for cooking. This was the birth of the modern dessert banana, and it's one of the great ironies that the very fruit that's cited so often by anti-evolutionists as an example of something that they claim arrived on the planet perfectly designed for human consumption is actually the product of well-documented artificial selection and natural mutation which would cease to exist altogether in its present form without human intervention. If you claim that the theory of evolution says any of the following, it shows either that you simply don't understand what evolution is, which can be remedied with a little reading from trustworthy sources, or that you're being deliberately dishonest and trying to create confusion about science in the hope that this will lead to more support for your position. Either way, attempts to make evolution seem like a fairy tale by both the misinformed and the dishonest will continue to be exposed. The real fairy tale is the claim that evolution has anything whatsoever to do with dogs giving birth to cats, crocoducks, and animals morphing into other species or popping into existence through pure accident. If you speak to anyone who knows about and accepts evolution, you'll find that these ideas are as ridiculous to them as they are to the anti-evolutionist. And if you're a reasonable person, this should also make you wonder very seriously why, if these people are so confident they can prove evolution's impossible they need to concoct such demonstrably false propaganda about it.